Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Welcome back to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Stewart. Today, I'm joined by a senior manager, solution engineering and town development. And we are talking about early career development for recent grads. Welcome to the show, Steve Bullington. Thank you. Glad to be here. Now, you've been in sales for, for a while now. You've been in sales leadership for 29 years. Yeah. And then we were talking on the, when we did the pre-interview that four years ago, you made a bit of a shift in your career. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah. So actually it kind of started about seven years ago as I started looking ahead as to what I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, I found that the, the part of being in sales leadership that I was most in tune with, that I was most passionate about was really the training and development piece. And so I started moving towards an opportunity where I could move into that as a full-time role. So I taught a class uh, at a master's program on sales. I started doing some mentoring uh, with some college, um, college programs and eventually got the opportunity to go to a software company based here in Indianapolis and start a sales academy program for recent college grads for them. And that was kind of the beginning and two steps down the road. Now I'm at Salesforce and uh, I'm excited to have been part of a program, help start a new program here uh, about a year and a half ago. Perfect. And I normally don't dive too much into the, into the guest sort of like background in terms of what they're doing today, but I think it makes a lot of sense um, in terms of adding a lot of context to the, for the rest of the episode, because we're really, we're going to spend most of today talking about early career development for recent grads. And a lot of that is going to be within the context of the program that Salesforce uses to take a new grad and ramp them into a sales career. And, sure. and that's, and we've got a variety of different ways of doing that. The reason why I think it's important is because it's Salesforce, not just because of the name, but because of the size and the scope of the organization, not everybody's going to have the same resources as going to be able to have a Steve. Not everybody is hiring, you know, hundreds of people at a time. Um, and so, you know, take what I'm going to try and do throughout the episode is sort of point out areas where, you know, this is applicable to sort of startups or companies of any size not just sort of if you work at a company that hires hundreds of people all at one time. Yeah, and actually the, the first program I started uh, was for a company called Interactive Intelligence, which was a contact center software company, uh, about 2,000 employees, and our first cohort was eight recent college grads. And so, you know, this, a lot of it is applicable. It's just really about scale. Uh, today, we, we, I have a cohort. We have a cohort running right now. It has 55 in it. We, we've already uh, run through um, 70 in our first, first two cohorts here at Salesforce. So, it's really a, about scale and it's about taking the pieces that make sense for your organization that you have both uh, the capacity and the need for and figuring out how to use those more than, you know, going out and hiring 10 people to run a program or something. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I've been really looking forward to this episode. Um, one of the things we've started doing recently is helping companies build remote sales teams. And, and part of that building process is onboarding new, you know, people that are new to sales. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm deep in the thick of it. So um, I'm going to steal a whole bunch of knowledge from you today. And so I'm, I've, I've got personal motivations because I'm, I'm actually right in the middle of working on this. And it's a, it is, for me, it's a blend of like trying to pull what I've learned from podcast guests, trying to take a blend from, you know, what Aaron's learned when he was at Salesforce and take sure. a blend from what we actually do here at Predictable Revenue because it's, you know. Um, and so I'm, that's one of the reasons why I'm really excited to have you on the show here. Um, and so just for context, the, how many cohorts a year are you doing? So we're currently doing two. So we do one that starts at the beginning of the year, start, well, the next one will start at the end of January, and then we do one that starts in mid-July. And, and that really is driven mostly by the fact that that's the alignment that you can get with the school year. So you got to kind of work with, within the semester construct. So right now we're in the process of recruiting for our January cohort, that will, we are looking at within one year of graduation. So anybody that graduated in 2019 would be eligible to participate in that cohort. Uh, and then the same, you know, you know, probably about two months, we'll start rec recruiting for the July cohort. Um, so 
in my past life, uh, I ran one cohort a year, uh, smaller company, smaller need. Uh, and then I also started a sales internship program as well. So that's kind of what I did in the off season was help run that sales internship program. And the, the long-term plan was that we basically would fill the sales academy with graduates of our sales internship program. So we would move towards recruiting interns as our predominant feeder. And then, you know, if we liked them and they liked us, we would make them an offer before they went back to school. And when they graduated, they would come back in and, and feed into our, our uh, sales academy program. Interesting. And so that was, it's almost like the playing in the minors before you get called up to the big leagues. Yeah. Because if you think about it, you know, particularly with salespeople, the biggest risk is, hey, you know, are they going to be able to succeed? You know, are they going to have the work ethic? Are they going to have the, the resilience that's going to be required to, to succeed in a sales role? Well, what better way to get a feeling for that than actually have them come spend a summer with you? see, you know, are they showing up on time? Are they, you know, giving you the, the extra effort that it mm -hmm. takes to be successful in sales? And then they're going to know whether they like you too and whether they like being in sales. Because I've, I've met a lot of people who thought they wanted to be in sales until the first time they heard no. And then all of a sudden they wanted to be in customer success or something along that line. So, yeah. you know, I, I truly believe it's a two way street. You know, we're, we're test driving them. They're test driving us just like when we're interviewing, you know, I tell students all the time, look, you're interviewing us as much as we're interviewing you and that you should go into every interview with that same mindset because the worst thing you can do is, think you're going to a great place only to find out that it's not a cultural fit for you. Mm -hmm. And, and what I, I, I say this somewhat sarcastically, but what better way to make sure somebody sticks around than to ensure that their grades and potentially passing college is on the line. Well, and even, even on top of that, I mean, if your organization's in a position that you can give them a signing bonus, uh, you put a little uh, insurance policy in place that they don't go back to school and start going to the job fairs. If you give them, you know, a thousand bucks or 2000 bucks, which, you know, to a college student is a ginormous sum of money, mm -hmm. uh, have them sign a, you know, if I don't come back, I got to give the money back statement. Uh, then, you know, you're, you're putting a little guarantee in your pocket as well, that you're going to, you're going to get people and they're going to, they're going to stay with you. So uh, it's, I, I am a firm believer in that methodology. I think if you're going to have interns, if you like them and you know you're going to have a role for them, you know, when they get out in, in May or June, you know, you ought to be making offers to them before they walk out the door. Because once they go back to school, I was just at Indiana University on Wednesday. I was at the Kelly School of Business Career Fair. There was over a thousand students there. You know, they're all looking for jobs. How relaxing is it to go back to school knowing you have a job in June, knowing you can just focus on, you know, getting, getting your degree done and maybe having a little fun with the money the company gave you. Uh, and as an employer, knowing that if, you know, if I have a cohort of, of eight and I've already filled six of those spots with people that I know and trust, I'm lowering my overall risk because now I've only got two that I'm, that I'm hiring on spec, so to speak. And so this hiring bonus, is this for entering the program or is that once they're in the program, you're trying to lock them into a contract and, and give them a signing bonus? Yeah, so my philosophy was, and, and unfortunately, because interactive intelligence got acquired as I was just getting this built, my philosophy was that before, you know, if we offered them a position at the end of their internship, to come back full time after graduation that we'd give them the signing bonus then. So that way, you know, there was skin in the game for them to come back to work for us. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a thousand or 2000 bucks is not going to break most organizations, but it's, you know, it's a huge amount of money for a 22 year old to have to pay, pay somebody back if they want to go do something else or whatever. So, it's good, you know, it's a, it's a plus for the student and it's a, to me, it's an insurance policy for the, for the employer. Mm -hmm. Even if they were going to stick around in the first place, you've got this guarantee that, that, yeah, yeah that they're going to come back. Yeah. That's great. Um, I'm glad we got a chance to dive into that because I'm, I'm 
we had mostly mapped out sort of, you know, what you're doing at Salesforce. And I think that's a really great sort of pre, you know, if, if for companies that are looking to help sort of build top of top of funnel for this, that's before you even jump into the recruiting pipeline, this is absolutely something that you can do. Yeah. Um, and so, so when you, when you're looking for, you know, when you're looking for new recruits from colleges with Salesforce, where, where do you start? So one of the things that, that I've done since I moved into this space is to really establish relationships with universities, not at the, you know, job fair kind of uh, employment office level, but at the departmental level and even at the professor level. Hmm. Because if, you know, when I was in a smaller organization, um, we would have our table at a job fair and nobody knew who we were, what we did, and, you know, there was nobody waiting in line to talk to us. Mm -hmm. So the easiest way and the most cost effective way was for me to have alignment with, you know, a program to where I'm going in there, I'm speaking at classes, I'm judging sales competitions. Uh, I am involved at, you know, the departmental level. And what I found is then I get, you know, I get some of the better students coming out of that class. Uh, I'm very fortunate in that I've been able to be involved in a program that I got my master's in and lead a, help lead a career exploration day. And I've done that for about nine years. Uh, I'm on their advisory board. So, you know, all I have to do is send the email and that gets disseminated out. Uh, I've, some of the universities, some of the, particularly some of the sales programs are looking for financial sponsorship. So they, you know, they want your organization to write a check and then, and then you can be involved at that level as well. And if that fits in your strategy and your budget, I highly recommend it because uh, as I said, I was in Indiana University the other day and Gartner was in speaking to uh, one of the sales classes. Well, what better way, you know, to, to get visibility and get to shake hands and kiss babies with um, the better students that are in that program than to be standing in front of the classroom for an hour. Mm -hmm. So, but you also can do it by establishing a personal relationship and bringing something back to the program because that's the one thing that I found with leaders of sales programs at universities is they're trying to stay fresh on what's going on and, and, and they like bringing industry experts in to speak at their classes, to speak at their sales clubs, you know, whatever the case may be. So by stepping up and raising your hand, say, hey, I'd like to know how I can help out to the local university that's 20 minutes away, you know, you're positioning yourself well and you're giving something back to them that's they're going to find valuable. Hmm. And so in order to like to get on these advisory panels and to find the professors, you're just, you're basically just prospecting, reaching out and saying, Hey, how can I help? Yeah. When I went, uh, when I went to interactive intelligence, that's literally what I did is I, I called the program at, I went to Ball State University and I called the, the sales program there and say, Hey, I'd like to find out how we can get involved. And I did the same thing at Indiana university. And, and in both of the cases at that time, you know, we were in a position to write them a sponsorship check and, so, you know, almost immediately they had me coming in and presenting in their classes or like I said, coaching, you know, or coaching and giving feedback in their sales competitions and things like that. So, uh, but similarly, I work with this master's program that I went through. We, you know, other than some occasional small, you know, event-based sponsorships, uh, it's just the long-term relationships that I've had there that, uh, I've had the former director, I mean, has been sending me candidates for the last four years because we've, we've known each other since 1997. So uh, he, he wants his folks to have jobs and he, uh, and I've been given back similarly by putting, helping to run this career exploration day for the last nine years. Right on. And so it's not just about writing the check. If you can, if you are in a position to write the check, those are helpful, but developing the relationships one-on-one -on -one with the professor seems to be the bootstrappers model, if you can. Yeah. And, and it's, even if you can write the check, you still have to be involved. Just having your name on the wall is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. You've got to be in there. You want to be, I, I loved judging at the sales competitions 
uh, not only because I got to see the students from our sponsored university in action, mm -hmm. but I got to see students from all over the country. So I might come across somebody from Western Michigan who I would have no visibility to whatsoever who, you know, blew me away during their, their sales competition where I was, I was being the buyer and they were selling to me. And, you know, we get to the end, I'm like, Hey, you know, here's my card. Give me a call. We'd love to talk to you about an opportunity. Um, and I, I have found that to be, you know, an invaluable opportunity. And that's one of those areas where most of the sales programs are always scrambling the week of the sales competition to get some buyers to sit in and, and be that role play subject with them. So, you know, if, if that's all you ever did with a sales program at a, a university near you, you're going to see in the course of a day, you know, 10, 15 students that are studying sales and are at a level that they have confidence and competence to actually sit down in a chair and, and do a role play. So that's a day well spent for any hiring manager. I think anytime you get a chance to see people live and in action without expending a crazy amount of hiring resources, like putting somebody through your full interview process, I think that's a, that's a huge win. Yeah. And you put it back on them to see if, you know, A, they're interested and B, they, they do good follow up, you know? So if you hand them a card and say, Hey, we have opportunities. I'd love to talk to you. If they follow up, that's great. And if they don't, you know, all it's cost you is a business card and that's not a bad thing. That's fair. And so, so let's jump into after, after we've um, gone to these recruiting, recruiting fairs, we were in, engaged with the professors. Now we're moving into, we've, you know, we've given out some business cards and the students are responding back to us. Um, are you ta taking on the screening um, of the candidates? Do you pass that off to a recruiter? How does that work? So it's been all of the above. I mean, it, here uh, we have, we have a recruiting team called Future Force. They take the first cut at everybody. Uh, actually, in my current role, I don't have hiring responsibility. As I tell people, uh, whoever they send across the white lines, who I'm going to coach up. Mm -hmm. So, but in, in my past role, you know, I worked with a recruiter and and then was the hiring manager. So, and then obviously as a sales manager for 25 years, I lost track how many people I interviewed and hired over that course of time. So, uh, so I, I think it's, it can, it can fall any way. So as somebody who's done a, a ton of hiring, what are some traits that you're looking for in the interview process? Yeah. The biggest challenge of early career professionals, unlike hiring, you know, people that have experience and been out in the field is they, you know, if, if you were to hire, or you were interviewing me for a role, well, I've got 30 plus years of, experience that we can talk about. Mm -hmm. You know, I have successes, I have stories, I have, you know, things that can demonstrate what I'm going to bring to your organization. When you're hiring early career professionals and, and current college students, you're hiring potential. And so you've got to figure out how to uncover that potential. And I always tell people that, you know, when I'm looking at those, I'm really looking at three things. Um, a, do they have a proven work history? Because if mom and dad didn't get them out of bed at 15 and have them going to Papa John's or wherever, I don't, I don't want to be the guy that has to teach them that. Um, second, are they bright? Not, real, not are they smart, not are they book smart, not do they have a 4.0 and all that, but do they get it? Are they, are they adaptable? Can they take in information and, and know how to use it versus just regurgitate it? And then the third one, and, and probably, you know, one, you know, one of one A, B, and C is, um, are they great communicators, both written and verbal? Because if they can't communicate, and particularly in a technology field where you have to be able to speak English and use words that are meaningful to people and not acronyms that your company uses internally, then they're never going to be successful. So as I'm, as I'm interviewing candidates, those are the three things that I'm building my questions around to, to draw out of them to find out, are they going to bring those three things to the table? Because that's the potential. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to make that dis hiring decision on. And, and quite frankly, even when I was hiring you know, tenured people, I was still looking for those same three things. 
I just got the added bonus that if they'd been in our industry for 10 years working for one of our competitors, that was, that was kind of a fourth thing that I could delve down into. Yeah, there's quite a bit more work history, plus there's more relevant references for you. Right. So I'm wondering what the context of these interviews look like. Like, is it just you, the two of you sitting down having a chat or do you take them out of the office? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, so I typically will have two to three just the two of us. So I'll do that initial phone screen and, and that's where I'm looking at things like what is that work history? So I'll ask a question like, tell me about the first job you ever had a W-2 for. And what I want to hear is, well, at 16, I went to work at the gas station or I went to work at McDonald's or whatever. Um, what I don't want to hear is, well, that would be the internship that I just finished last month. Hmm. Uh, you may have had a great internship experience. You may be an amazing candidate. But if you think about, you know, the young person who went to work at McDonald's at 15 and the college student whose first job was at 22 as an intern, who's had more you know, face-to-face -face customer experience, who's had more coworker interactions, you know, all those things where the world goes off the rails, the person who's been doing it since they were 15 has had to learn a lot of life lessons that the person at 22 who's only worked for 12 weeks just hasn't had enough at-bats to even have that many life lessons. So, after I've asked that question, then my follow-up to that is, tell me the most important lesson that you learned from that job. And I want to hear, you know, what they take away from it. So, you know, a lot of times I hear, well, I realized why I was going to college. So I didn't have to work at McDonald's or, you know, wherever. And, you know, that's a good answer too. So that, you know, that's kind of the, the screen. And then other questions around that about teams, about why they chose what university they went to, why they chose what they wanted to major in. So a lot of questions that are going to kind of give me a little bit of insight into who they are and what they're about. So once I've taken the top of the funnel and now when I come down the next piece, now I want to dig into a lot more around who they are. So... I'll ask questions like, tell me the most interesting thing that you've read lately that you weren't required to for a class. Because what I want to look at is, are they just focused on the assignment given to them or do they have a broader curiosity about the world? And are they taking things in and they're able to summarize and give back? Because in sales, you need to be constantly taking in information. And I've got to take it in and then be able to use it three months later as I'm sitting out at a customer that's in the agriculture business and say, you know, I read an article a couple months ago about X. How, how does that impact your business? You know, at the time I read it, there was probably no plan for me to, oh, I know I'm going to, you know, go going to use this three months ago when I'm out in front of this hybrid seed corn company. Mm -hmm. But by taking in a whole bunch of different information, I can have that conversation. I'm not a master of it. I'm about an inch deep and a mile wide on it. But if they're not taking in things that are not assignments, they're, they're working from a deficit. So I'm going to ask questions like that that kind of give me a fuller picture of who they are. And then the final interview that I do with them, and typically then we, we wrap it up with a panel, is uh, an exercise that I've been doing for quite a while, and I'm a huge fan, and I do it, I did it with tenured people as well. And it's really a test of that communications skill. And so I'll say, all right, here's what I want to do. I'm going to give you five minutes to explain something to me, Colin. I don't care what it is. It could be how to bake chocolate chip cookies to the fundamentals of cricket. But I want you to th take into consideration that I know nothing about the topic at this moment. And at the end of five minutes, I should really have the fundamental understanding of that topic. So I want you to take however much time you need to, to bring your thoughts together, let me know, and then we'll go. And that is the one of the most telling ways that you can understand whether somebody's an effective communicator or not. Because A, 
until this podcast, they've never been, <laughs> been prepared for that question. No, but no college is saying, hey, you need to be able to do this. And you really get to see if they can think on their feet, if they can articulate, if they can explain something simply without going down a rabbit hole. And I've had, I've had people that I had one young man that was talking about the skills required to live abroad. Uh, and it was his, actually his master's thesis. And I was so fascinated by what, it, the, what he was telling me that I literally quit. I didn't look at, look at the clock to see how long it had been. I, to this day, I have no long, how long he talked, but I know it was longer than five minutes. But I was so engaged with the topic that he, I was all in. Correspondingly, I had a young man, did a really great job, you know, had done great till then. As soon as he started to explain things, he got nervous. And unfortunately, as soon as he got nervous, he had a stutter. And this was for a job that would eventually end up in inside sales. Mm -hmm. So being nervous and that turning into a stutter is just flat out not going to work in an inside sales role. So, you know, unfortunately... Um, we, we didn't come together on that, but fortunately for us, you know, had I not used a methodology like that, I would have never known that until we are, he was already on the payroll. So those are the kinds of things that I do to, to uncover that potential. And, you know, I would recommend that, that last exercise to any hiring manager that's hiring customer facing employees, because they're not expecting it. And you're really going to see what they're, what they're made of when they do it. We, um, we always try and find in our hiring process, try and find a way of getting somebody to perform. And this, this seems like a, a much easier way. Generally we'll say, okay, if they've in like, if they've been in outside of school, they've got some experience, we will get them to sell to us. Yeah. Um, I always think back to poor Sarah, who we hired uh, at the beginning of this year and she used, she was an actor. She still is on the side. And I was like, great, tell me about the, like, what was the last thing you auditioned for? And she was kind of shy about it. And it turned out to be, I won't go into the details, but it was this very intense scene um, from a play. And it was basically one lover to another. And she's like, this is the only part I know roughly off script. So she gave the phone to line to, to somebody else. She's like, okay, you're going to hold this. And I'm going to look at this whiteboard. I'm not making <laughs> eye contact with anybody because it's a super intense scene. And she nailed it. And obviously, she's doing a great job here. Um, but I thought everybody kind of like looked at me like, this is being really mean. It's like, well, you know, it, not that we weren't sure, but I want to see how she's going to hold up under pressure because so yeah. much. And, and she absolutely rocked it. And like she could have, you know, failed the rest of the interview process. But after that, after that performance is like she had, you can tell she has skills. She's able to memorize lines. Um, she's like, she, I don't, I don't remember if she even got the part. Um, but she put all that work in just for yeah. us. Like that's hustle. Like you're, you're willing to grind for something you love. Like I'll take, I'll take somebody like that any day. Well, and that's it. And that five minute exercise kind of does that same thing. I mean, I, you know, if you're explaining how to make toll house cookies, I mean, not only do you have to be able to explain it and break it down, but you've got to keep me engaged for five minutes. And if you can do that, then, you know, you're going to probably be successful when we teach you how to talk about our product as well. So I am, I'm a big fan anytime you can put them on stage with minimal preparation because a lot of people do. And actually at, at Salesforce, we, we have, a lot of our roles, you know, put together a presentation that they bring in for that final interview. And there is value to that. But I, you know, if somebody can think on their feet, they're going to be great in sales. They're much, I'd much rather have somebody who's quick on their feet than somebody who can stand there and click the PowerPoint deck. Yep. A hundred percent agree. I won't dive into my thoughts on PowerPoints in sales, but <laughs> that's a, I don't know if that'd be a podcast or a rant. I, I think I could rant right alongside you. So yeah. I'm a whiteboard guy myself. I th think if you can explain something on a whiteboard, you actually know it and it's meaningful and anybody can memorize PowerPoint deck. That's fair. I always feel like I'm, I have a, a disability for whiteboard selling because I'm left-handed. Oh so yeah. I go to so write, you're making a mess. And I have to like 
I can't write like this and sort of push. I, I stand in front of the whiteboard and I'm yeah. the worst whiteboard presenter because I'm like, stare at my back while I write some stuff. <laughs> I never really mastered the, you know, the proper technique. Well, they say you can go eight to 10 seconds without talking uh, and your audience will stay with you if you're writing on the whiteboard. So just, just keep that clock running in your head. <laughs> so just to summarize some of the things that you're looking for in the meetings in terms of, you know, um, things that they're demonstrating, you're looking for people that are good at thinking on their feet. Um, they can explain something simply. What else are you looking for? You know, again, I think that I, I am a huge believer in sales that the more curious you are, the more successful you're going to be. Because you have to really, you know, you're in front of all kinds of different people in all different kinds of industries and companies. You have to be really interested in learning about them and learning about their business and their customers. And if you're not, if you're there just to make your pitch, and it's the same thing every single time, ultimately, you're not going to succeed. Those, those days are well gone. So, you know, they talk a lot about empathy. And to me, a big part of empathy is that true, genuine curiosity. So, you know, I'm, that's like when I ask the question about tell me something that you've read, that's one of the things I'm looking for is, all right, well, you know, well, so what, le what led you to read that? Oh, well, my, my dad had shared that article with me and da, 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 da. you know, I, I want to know where they're coming from because, you know, I get a lot of things that I read off podcasts. So I'll be listening to an author. I'm, I'm actually just finishing a book today uh, that was from an author that I've known, but she has a new book and it's all about using data to tell a story. And, you know, so I've torn through this book now this week and then I'll start, I'm going to start using it in our, some of our training. Um, and it's all because I was listening to a podcast and one leads to reading a book, which leads to then creating some training around it. So, you know, that's the kinds of things that I'm looking for from a sales professional or a solutions engineer, or any of the roles that we're hiring for. You got me super curious. What, what's the name of the book? So the name of the book is Data Story. Nancy Duarte. By Nancy Duarte, who I I'm guessed. a gigantic fan of. I resonate as is one of the it's in fact it's laying on my desk right next to me it's been on my desk for the last like four or five years so mine's mine's just around the corner yep. and then if i'm if i'm in a position where i have to do slides myself i think her S other one slideology slideology yeah yep, yep. i uh, they they are tremendous and she was on uh, a podcast last week and i'm like okay i'm all in and you know before i'd even finished the podcast i'd already bought the book and and it came Tuesday and uh, I finished it, finished it today. So good Beautiful. stuff. What, uh, do you remember what podcast it was? Uh, it was the Franklin Covey podcast. Perfect. I'll see if I can track that down. Um, I'm just throwing in the links here, Nancy Duarte's Ted talk. Oh, love that. If you haven't checked it out, um, I highly, highly recommend it. I, I think similar to, similar to you, Steve, partway through her TED Talk, I was on the website buying Resonate yeah. and Slideology. Yeah, it's, uh, it's tremendous. And I, in fact, I was on, as this morning was on her website looking at public training classes that they're, gonna, they're teaching on this to see if I can uh, squeeze one of those in next year. Ooh, that'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah, Any, anything by Nancy Duarte. I'd love to, love to have some FaceTime with her just teaching. Absolutely. Had a present. I had a present. Yeah. Okay, I got got a little bit sidetracked, but I'm glad I <laughs> glad I asked. So let's let's move forward. We've uh, they've accepted the job now. So what happens once they've accepted the job? Yeah. So to me, this is where the structure kicks in, and and you know I am a believer, and we've tried to build our program really around structure, and that that starts from you know very shortly after they've accepted the job. So we start having what we call campfire calls. So everybody that's going to be in that cohort, we're, you know, getting together for half an hour, uh, about every six weeks or so, um, giving them some information, talking about the program, sharing information, sharing results from the previous cohort. 
making them start to feel part of the team. Uh, because, you know, particularly when you're hiring college students and, and a lot of the hiring is done this time of year. So by the first of November, usually a lot of that hiring is done. Well, it's a long time between November and June or July. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you want to you wanna invite them back in to remind them that, hey, we're here for you. We're doing this. You know, we're building this. Hey, here's some of the plan. This is what it's going to look like when you get here. Uh, all of that. And we found that to be really useful. Now we don't get, you know, everybody on every call, but, and that's why we do them kind of repeatedly. We also record them. So we send the recording a link to the recording out to everybody. So if somebody's in class and, you know, they can go back, but we want them to feel part of Salesforce when they, you know, while they're waiting to get here. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then those kind of pick up pace, as we get closer, you know, to the actual start date and we're, and we're sharing a lot of things. We're sharing, you know, apartment recommendations. We're sharing, you know, Hey, if you don't, if you're going to need a car and you don't want to bring one, here's, here's the Indy, you know, blue Indy electric car program you can, you can sign up for and, you know, sending things about, Hey, hundred great things to do in Indianapolis. And because a lot of the people and they're just coming here for six months, most of them, and this may be the first time and maybe the only time they're ever in Indianapolis. So we want them to feel good, not only about the program, but we want them to feel good about the city as well. And, uh, and then of course, Salesforce through our future force team uh, is, has got messaging going out to them as well. That's more Salesforce specific, not program specific. So, but it's all about, you know, it's all about structure and that really takes us up to that, that first day. And that first day, they come in, and just like every other Salesforce employee, they go through day one orientation. And we actually don't run that. We, um, we show up, and we make a big deal out of it. So we're, you know, we're there. We're, you know, we got the place all decorated up. We've got donuts. We're, you know, at lunchtime, we got a, we got a big lunch buffet. You know, all of our leaders are dressed in matching Hawaiian shirts. So we're, you know, we're ready to, they can pick us out of a crowd, so to speak, but we want them to feel really welcome. We want them to feel like, hey, this is, this is something truly special. Um, and from there, we just, you know, they start the cadence. So the next day we start introducing, you know, our program and Salesforce and the roles they're going into and who their leaders are. And, and we wrap up that first week by, doing some kind of a team building activity because I am a believer that relationships are not built in the office. They're built out of the office. And so, for example, with our February cohort this past year, um, we took them to Louisville, Kentucky to a place called the mega cavern, which is the home to the only underground zip lining course in the world. And we went down and we went zip lining through these uh, limestone caves that are in under the city of Louisville. Um, you know, nothing dangerous, nothing wild, but you know, it's a shared experience that they can all look back on that brought them together. You know, they were in a van for a couple hours each way. So they were, they were playing games you know, they were, they had some, some, you know, get to know me kind of game they were playing uh, in there. So it, and so we always try and build something like that into that for the end of that first week. So we start to build that camaraderie because they're going to have to work together. They're going to do a lot of group projects. They're going to do be paired up for presentations and all kinds of things. So the sooner we get them um, over, over the feeling of awkwardness, the mm -hmm. sooner that we'll start to see results out of them. That's fair. I was just pulling up the, uh, if you heard some noise on my end, uh, I was just pulling up a video of the super cavern zip lining. I'm going to, I'll send a link in or I'll throw <laughs> a link in the, in the show notes. Cause it looks just bonkers. This is, these aren't, these aren't like tiny little no. caves. This is, this is serious. Yeah. They, uh, they, it was a li underground limestone quarry and a lot of the bourbon companies store bourbon in there. And I think it's, MGM has their entire film vault. So all the actual film film yeah. is stored in there because it's dry and it's always 56 degrees and, and all this. So it's uh, it's an amazing 
place to go explore. And, and like I said, it's something that virtually none of them, even if they've been zip lining, you have never been zip lining in a cave. That's, that's probably fair. Yeah. I, I'm looking at it. You're and they're jumping off the zip lines into the darkness. Like yes. That's, yes. <laughs> all right. So the, so they come back from zip lining and now they're deep into Steve Bullington's territory here. So weeks, we're going to go through sort of weeks two to five, and this is where we really want to, we're going to go deep. Cause I think this is the, this is the meat and potatoes that, that a lot of people can, that we can all just borrow from Steve. And, and there's a lot to learn that anybody can not, we're not all, you know, a couple hour drive away from, uh, from some <laughs> beautiful zip lining underground. I'm sure you can find something, you know, near you that you can yeah. take, take the team to. Um, but I think the, this is, these are things that just about anybody will be able to implement. So wh where does the, where do you start when you start working on the professional, you know, development skills? Yeah. So we, and we, that's exactly where we start is at professional skills, because the reality of it is, you know, most organizations and, and I used to run global sales onboarding for a software company. And, you know, when they'd come in there for their four and a half days, it was really 75, 80% about product. Well, you know, again, I was bringing in tenured sales professionals. So that's what they really needed. They needed product and process, you know, of how we do it. They didn't need, you know, other stuff. Well, these are recent college grads and some of them may have had a tremendous amount of, you know, professional skills development experience in college. Some of them may not have had any. Uh, so we want to make sure that a, they know what that expectation looks like, and B, if they haven't had it, bring them up to some level of parity in the room. So we start really, you know, at the beginning, and that's with public speaking. So we do a, a full day on public speaking where we, we teach them kind of the, you know, the skills behind it, and then we give them opportunities to, you know, get up and present and we give them famous speeches and say, take a, take an excerpt out of this and we want you to get up and deliver it and get up and deliver it using the methodology that we taught you. And then we give them some feedback and then we send them back off again to let them go practice some more. And then we bring them back in and let them, let them deliver it again. And, you know, the idea is that almost everything we do for the next five plus months is going to have a component of public speaking to it. So, because if you're doing, I'm doing this podcast, this is, this is public speaking. You know, if I'm doing a presentation, if I'm, you know, making a prospecting call, all of that, you know, has componentry of public speaking in it. So we literally start at that, that beginning phase. Um, that leads us into the next day where we, we spend a whole day on storytelling technique because the reality of it is, you know, people don't want to hear about your stuff. They want to hear about what your stuff will help them do. And the best way to do that is to share a story from, you know, somebody that's had success with it in the past. And that, you know, that was one of the things with the, the book Resonate is I, I used to teach that methodology and I used her TED Talk and I used her, you know, the hero's journey. What was, what can be, you know, what was, what can be, you know, methodology, because it's a very, very usable approach to telling stories. And, you know, if you're working for a company, the good news is you've got customers who've had success that you've helped get somewhere. So, you know, teach them how to actually deliver those stories in a meaningful way. So, you know, when they're in a sales call and they're saying, well, you know, what you need to accomplish sounds a lot like X company. And let me tell, can I tell you a little bit about them and, you know, tell that, tell that story because I, I am a firm believer that whether you're, you know, an AE or an SE, you need to have this collection of stories that's just in the Rolodex between your ears mm -hmm. that you can pull out at a moment's notice to use to reinforce a point. So, you know, we use a very similar tech, technique and then we teach the methodology. We send them off. We hand out, hand out customer success stories and we say, go craft a story, then come back in, let them present, give them some feedback, send them back out, let them practice a different one, come back in, give them some feedback. So we, we try and use this, this uh, methodology called interleaving in anything we do. So you teach them a little, you, you let them go do it. You teach them a little more, you let them go do it. 
And, you know, that works particularly well in this instance, because again, this is, this is kind of the, the second tier of those foundations in that, you know, we taught you public speaking, now we're going to teach you storytelling, you know, and then we're going to kick it up a notch from there. So from there, we go into whiteboarding, we go into, you know, how to craft an effective presentation, we go into demo skills. So mm -hmm. all of the things that they're going to have to do. So then at the end of week four, we have them do a small um, customer presentation that is an accumulation and based on a real case, but a, an accumulation of all the skills that we've, we've developed over those three and a half weeks. So by the time we get there, they've got those, all the foundational professional skills that they're going to need for everything else we're going to ask them to do over the next, next five months. I really love the, the interleaving model, I think is what you called it, where yeah. you're, you're showing them how to do it, then you go do it, then you give them some feedback, then you get them to do it again, then you give them some feedback. I, I really, really like that. Um, yeah, I stole, I never, I, we were doing it that way anyways, but I never knew what it was called. I just finished a book called Make It Stick, and it's about learning methodology and what really works from a learning strategy standpoint. And, and it was defined in there. It's like, oh, that's what we've been doing. I knew, I knew there was probably a name for it. I just never knew what it was. So That's Chip and Dan Heath, right? No, it's, uh, that's actually, made, I think, called Made to Stick. This is oh. by uh, three guys, Peter Brown, Henry Rodinger, and Mark McDaniel. And it's called Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. Perfect. I am throwing these in the show notes. If Great. you're an audiobook nerd like myself and you're going to go download and read all these uh, and read them again. Um, success, full learning. Perfect. Um, I wanted to get into, you, you sort of mentioned it, with storytelling, it's super important. I'm, I'm curious how you teach storytelling. So you, do you just give them a, here's a case study, read this and then come tell me a story? Yeah. So we actually teach them a construct. So Salesforce has its own version of Nancy Duarte's resonate um, that we teach them, Hey, this is, this is what goes into an effective story. And then we give them basically the data points that they need to turn into a verbal version of a, of a story. So, and, and that's a methodology that, that I've been using for about five or six years. Um, because I am, I am a believer in it and I'm a, I also believe that, you know, it's a relatively new event that salespeople are being trained on this. Uh, although I'm sure most of us have done it most of our lives without even knowing we were doing it or knowing there was science behind the impact that it has. So, you know, my recommendation would be is if you, your organization doesn't have a methodology. There, there are a whole lot of things out there. Um, from Nancy Duarte's Resonate is is an impeccable version, and there's you know like her TED Talk blends in nicely with that. Um, there's an, another program I went through called Story Brand um, by a guy um, Donald Miller out of Nashville, and it's again very similar. It's the hero's journey. I mean, you know, the hero's journey doesn't doesn't change. It's just the con context that they put it in. Um, so if you, you know, you go look for storytelling, you, you know, business storytelling, you'll find several resources, but you know, if I were to recommend one, it would be resonate because it, it, it works and it's easy to use and it's relatively easy to teach. And it's very focused on the customer in, her, you know, her whole thing is you don't introduce how you're going to help until the end of the story. Mm -hmm. So we're, you know, a lot of things, oh, well, let me tell you about how we're going to help, you know, how Salesforce can help you do X. No, here's what our customers faced with. Here's where they wanted to go, but they were struggling with this and they wanted to, you know, end up here. And by choosing to work with Salesforce, you know, and, you know, that's the whole thing about the hero's journey is there's always that Yoda, you know, that advisor that's there. And that should be your role as you know, the, the person working with the customer, you're there just to point them in a direction. You're not there to be the hero. Mm -hmm. You know, Luke Skywalker is the hero. 
Yoda is just the little guy that says, hey, perhaps you should do it this way. Hey, spoiler alert. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry if I ruined that. Uh, you know, that only came out in 1979. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't, it, like, it was such a perfect analogy because it's I, that, like, I can still see the visual and, and her explaining that. And the number of times I've told reps, like, listen, we are Yoda, they're yeah. Luke. Let yep. them be Luke and don't like the, the sales call isn't about taking the stage and, and us presenting. It's about sort of gently guiding them. And if the way that they choose is the way that we've sort of recommended, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. You, you mentioned something interesting in there as sort of around the discovery side of things. I'm wondering how, like, this is, this is one of the skills that you teach. How do you go about teaching sort of discovery? Yeah. So we're very, again, work for Salesforce. So we have a, a whole, process around customer centric discovery. Uh, again, I don't think it's anything mystical and magical, but it's, you know, it's really taking that innate curiosity that they're bringing to the job and harnessing it and putting it, you know, putting it together with, you know, the research and what, what you're going at, what you're looking for, how you're aligning to that. So, you know, there, you know, there are a lot of really great books. Um, you know, my three favorite uh, sales authors are Mike Weinberg, Anthony Inarino, and Jeb Blunt. And, you know, all of them, you know, have various ways that they define effective customer centric discovery. And so picking up in, you know, any of those guys stuff is, is going to point you in the right direction. And again, you know, the, the thing that I am a believer in, you know, is that, and you, you start off by talking about, you're going to steal some stuff from me. I don't think there's any, I've yet to see anything that's new. I think it's just repackaged in a way that makes an impact. And, you know, I'm a believer that, you know, a big part of my job as a training and development person is to be taking in a lot of information and synthesizing it into something that we can use to, to help develop our people. So, you know, you don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to go to, you know, go get certified on something. You pick up, you know, you pick up Resonate or you pick up, you know, uh, fanatical prospecting by Jeb Blunt mm -hmm. and you say, okay, right, how, right. how are we going to use that? I, I mean, to me, that's, that's the Bible of prospecting. I mean, I, I would, I would chain that to any salesperson's hand the day they started. I, I agree. It's a, it's absolutely a great book. Um, I like, I love how tactical he gets in it, which, yeah. which I think is the one is the, the one not sort of mark against predictable revenue, the book. It was like, it's, it was a great at a high level of telling the story of, you know, really here's why you should specialize your sales roles. Here's why you should be using an email centric approach. Yeah. Jeff Lode is like tactical. All right, this is yeah. how you get into all of the details. Yeah. Predictable revenue to me, you know, when I read it, I looked at it. It was more of a, a VP level. Here's how we got to structure our organization where Jeb is, hey, you're a sales guy. You got a quota that needs to be hit in October do this tomorrow. And Anthony and Arino and Mike Weinberg are both very, very much the same way. And, and that's why I really appreciate what they bring to the table because it, their stuff is actionable. You know, there is a time for theory and there is a time for strategic construct, but most salespeople don't need strategic construct. They need, Hey, what can I do tomorrow to sell more stuff and to help more people? And, and I think if we come back to customer centric discovery, Mike Weinberg's book, I'm, I'm totally with you on Weinberg and Arena and Blunt. Um, I, I, I want to call him Blunt, but is it's pronounced, it's spelled bloat. I can never okay. tell. Um, I, I, don't know which, I, I don't know which yeah, one it is. I don't know. It's one of the two. <laughs> let's go with Blunt for now. I, I can't say I know Anthony and Arena's stuff as well, but Mike Weinberg, New Sales Simplified. What, like just hands yeah. down one of those great all round sales books and his new one sales truth is outstanding uh came out about probably about two months ago and um that was another one that i tore through in about four or five days oh really yeah sales truth perfect what i'm doing here i'm i'm we've got a 
professional development skills list that uh, Steve gave me. And I'm just going through and I'm, I'm tapping Steve for all the recommendations on, <laughs> on books and things. And what I'll do when I, when I finish is I'll, I'll put that in the show notes so that it, these aren't just my personal notes. I'll share it with everybody. Cause I think there's going to be some really actionable show notes that I'm definitely coming back to. Um, so we've got, we've got that. We've got, um, we had talked about a little bit about presenting that, you know, inspired by Duarte as well there. Yeah. I mean, I am a believer in, you know, powerful, visually impactful, not, you know, slides. They, they need to tell a story, you know, even a demo should be telling a story and, it drives me insane when somebody puts a slide up that is I've, I've pasted, you know, an Excel spreadsheet into a slide or I've, I've written, you know, war and peace on a slide because that's not the purpose of PowerPoint or, you know, uh, whatever, whatever modality you're using. It's there to support the story you're telling. And so, um, you know, that's why, you know, Slideology, I think, is is just an amazing book for putting you in that direction. And actually, um, Data Story does a really good job of doing that same thing with charts and and uh, how you how you lay something out to sell this story uh, using using data points and being simple and being clean and being transparent. And, you know, it was funny. So I started using presentation software and probably, I don't know, 94, 95. And I think, you know, I worked for four different companies from that point until like 2014. And every one of their corporate decks looked exactly the same. You could just interchange the logos. It was, you know, Here's, you know, here's our thing. Here's our agenda. Here's our slide that shows our corporate headquarters, why anyone cares what your corporate headquarters building looks like. Here's your NASCAR slide of all the people that do business with you. And it was 100% about telling your story as a seller, not their story as somebody who wants to get something. And so, you know, to me, I try and avoid uh, like the plague, anything that doesn't tell the story we're trying to help the customer live. And so if, you know, if I can put in there, you know, about if, if it's going to help them sell this internally by having that, you know, Salesforce is the number one, been ranked the number one place to work in the world for the last five years or whatever it is. And that's something that's going to be important to the story we're trying to help them with, then I'll put it in there. But if it's not, then it's pretty much irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I like using personas for salespeople. I want to talk about a person that is, could be in your organization who you, that solution is going to help. You know, so if it's, you know, in our case where we're selling sales cloud, I want to talk about, you know, a sales rep and a sales manager and a sales vice president and the challenges they're facing today. Now, it doesn't, you know, probably ain't going to be one of theirs, but it should be representative of the conversations that you had with people in their organization. So, I'll, you know, because every, you know, we all know people buy based on emotion and then they justify it based on the facts. So, I want to bring some emotion into it. You know, I want, I want people to be a part of that. And, you know, and similarly, that's where the storytelling, you know, having, it needs to have an arc to it as well. I was, uh, we were doing some presentations yesterday and, and uh, one of our guys started off with, and I, and I don't remember the guy, but he's the Greek, Greek god of wine, who I, I was such a thing. And he starts off and it, it was a beautiful kickoff. And I, I, he puts this slide up of this statue of this Greek god of wine. And he starts telling this story about, you know, how he had this basket and it had a hole in it and he kept putting stuff in. And he, the whole point is, you know, we're trying to help you close that, that hole in your basket so you're not draining out as much data as you're bringing in. And I told him, you know, the only thing that was missing from that story is at the very end, there should have been a, a picture of two people clinking glasses of wine to wrap that up, you know, and that's the end of that story arc. And, and it sounds corny, but that's what 
that's how you look different than your competitor who's coming in the door tomorrow. And that's ultimately, you know, one of those important things is we, we have to give them a different experience. And we can do that with even with our PowerPoint decks can give them that different experience. And so when you're teaching this, you're, you're walking them through, let's say, Nancy Duarte, data story or slideology, you basically extract the core principles from there. And then you say, all right, go into a room, do a presentation. Yeah. Is it a presentation on anything? Is it a presentation on a specific product? Yeah. So usually early on, it's, it's very, very high level, very generic. So we always try and use real customers. So we always want to use something that they can go out and find assets and find information around. So we may say, okay, you know, you're going to be selling to Eli Lilly and company, and here's the scenario. Now, you know, go do this and then come back and show us what you got because they can find logos, they can find, you know, annual reports, all that kind of stuff. If you say, hey, you're calling on Bob's widgets, well, it's, you know, they're not going to have to do the things they're going to have to do when they're calling on a real customer. So, I, I am a 100% believer, you know, I was, I was writing some, some uh, cases this morning that we're going to use next week for uh, our capstone for our sales, uh, our sales cloud portion of the training. And, you know, I went out and I found real companies. I went on LinkedIn. I found real people who were in roles that would be part of the buying group that would be buying sales cloud. You know, I used, I went out to their annual report and I was pulling, you know, pulling language and data out of their annual report because that's what we're going to expect these guys to do when they go in the field. So if I am making weird stuff up, you know, they're, and quite frankly, it's just easier to use a real company <laughs> than yeah. it is to invent something out of whole cloth. It, it takes uh, takes away some of the that forced creativity, but it's also it, it's so much more real. And I yeah. think it's the you know working on a case study that's Bob's widgets. Yeah, you, you sort of sense like okay, this isn't a real company, so you you don't go that far. But if it is Eli Lilly, it's like well, there's so much information on Eli Lilly. As a student, you almost have an advantage because you can put as much work into it as you want. Um, which I love. And so you're starting, if I think about how you're teaching the the presentations here, it's, you know, you're teaching some, some core theory, then you say, okay, go, go away and present and build a presentation on whatever. Then you yeah. come back, you get some feedback and it's like, okay, now later in the program, go away, um, do a presentation for Eli Lilly centered around this particular product yep. and then come back. We give them some feedback and then we move on to the next one. Yeah, and as we get into our various products is where we start to, you know, build not only the presentation, but then a demo of, you know, so here, here's what we heard, here's the problems, you know, here's, here's our personas that, we're, that are facing these problems. Now let's switch over, let's show you the demo of how we think you can help overcome that. And, you know, use that as a setup and then a wrap up to the demo. And then, you know, one of the, the groups that we train are called business value analysts. And th those are the, the folks who come in with the sales team and help build the cost justification. So then, you know, they've, after we've kind of told that whole story, then their job is to wrap it up and show them, hey, and if you do this, you're going to get X and Y and Z. You know, you're going to prove productivity, minimize risk, enhance image, or increase revenue. Right on. One of the things that you mentioned that sort of stuck with me in the, in our pre-interview is you mentioned you teach them how to present with purpose. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit for me? Yeah, I think a lot of that just, it, it boils back to, you know, why, why are we telling the story? What is, you know, who is the audience and how, how do we need to speak to that audience? So, you know, if I'm presenting to an executive, it's probably got to be five slides, because they're, you know, they're not going to sit through a 45 slide PowerPoint deck. Now you may have the other 40 slides there as your appendix mm -hmm. that you're going to hand them, but I've got to be able to tell a story that's meaningful to them. That's at a C level exec level point of view. Similarly, I may be in the same customer, but now I'm talking to the director of sales operations who owns, owns the CRM solution, who has, you know, five guys who are running the CRM solution. 
I've got to talk to them in, in a way that is meaningful to them. And so I'm going to be a lot more tactical. I'm going to be a lot more, hey, this, you know, these are the changes you're going to have to make. And these are, you know, this is the, the training you're going to have to prepare for your salespeople and all that. So, you know, there is no way to create a single presentation for an entire organization. If it's an organization of size, um, that it's going to be meaningful to everybody. Uh, I had, I had a, a rep that I'd worked with several years ago and he was, uh, he was at a meeting at a large computer manufacturer and they were there as a, um, a guest of a consulting firm. And there were five people from the consulting firm in our company there. And there were 45 people from the computer company there. And one, and the, you know, they, they show up with this like, and the consulting company shows up with this like 40 slide PowerPoint presentation. And literally, you know, five minutes in, people were checking their phones. And then one of their guys who ran their current app, you know, solution took over the meeting and, and everyone was lost. So where if, you know, they had gone in with either probably smaller or more targeted groups. So instead of having one, one hour meeting, have three 20 minute meetings mm -hmm. and have that messaging targeted towards each audience, that would have been much more impactful than trying to do the 40 slide because you, you lost, you know, the VP in the room was gone by slide three. Yeah. And everybody else in the room was gone by slide 15. So, and, and now whoever convinced him to be there is mad that he's looking bad because you're wasting exactly. this VP's meeting. Um, so if I'm, if I follow you presenting with purpose is really about sort of calibrating who you're going to be calibrating your presentation to who's going to be in the room and yep. trying to get into their head and say, okay, who, what persona am I presenting to? What angle, what tactic are they going to respond best to? Like, yeah. how can I speak their language the most? Exactly. And, and tell a story that's going to be meaningful to them and help them in their role in the decision process. Because as we know, executives, I mean, they're typically pretty quickly synthesizing things and pulling the trigger one way or the other, where, you know, the tactical hands-on people are looking, you know, they want to know, okay, how do I log into this thing? Uh, you know, what kind of storage am I going to need? You know, whatever, whatever the, the pieces and parts, bits and bytes level of it, they're going to need a lot more detail around it where the, you know, CEO or the chief revenue officer or, you know, whoever, they, they want to know high level, okay, how is this going to help us sell more stuff? Okay, if I believe that what you're saying is true and everybody else on my team agrees, then we're probably going to move forward with it. If you come in and, you know, you're on slide five and I'm looking at a picture of your corporate headquarters, I, you know, I don't have time for this. 100%. And I think you're, you're right on the mark when it comes to making sure that we're, instead of having 100 people in the room and nothing is relevant to them, breaking it out into smaller meetings. And I think that was sort of the core message of Nancy Duarte's book, book Resonate, yeah. which was when you're, when you're trying to write something for everybody, you're actually writing something for nobody. Yep, absolutely. And she even goes uh, into, a, into another level of that here in, in Data Story and talks about that. And i I'm just, uh, I am a total disciple of her teaching. For data story, just sidebar with me. Would you recommend the pod, the audiobook version or the physical copy? I, I'm a physical copy guy when it comes to books because I take notes and I put tags and I, you know, do all that kind of stuff. So even if I do the audiobook, and there are times I will do the audiobook um, if I know I'm going to be traveling or something, and, and then I will typically go back and get the hard hardbound as well. And some of them like her and, and Weinberg and Blunt, I mean, I just get it right up front because I know I'm going to be, be uh, going destroying back. it with its, uh, with dog, dog ears and, and uh, highlighters. So. Yeah. The, all of Nancy's books I, I have in physical copy because especially with, with resonate and uh, slideology, they're just beautiful books. Yeah. They are, and this, and this one is as well. And, and, you know, she's a lot of times talking about there's, a, there's visual medium to what she's talking about. Mm -hmm. And so you may pick up on the concept listening to her. I mean, I certainly did listening to her on the podcast the other day. But, you know, to really see the impact, you want to see it, you know, in its physical form so you can figure out how you can adapt that to what you're trying to do.
totally fair. Okay. I'll, I'll definitely make sure I pick up, pick myself up a physical copy. It looked like more of a, like a hardcover book. So I, I thought yeah, it's actually, it's, it's yeah, it's soft cover. Oh, there it is. Okay. So it's, it's just, just like the other books in terms of form factor. So perfect. Okay. Um, sort of speaking of sort of the visual, more visual side of things, the one thing I sort of admitted to earlier on the podcast is being terrible at whiteboarding. And so, <laughs> you know, you mentioned you get, you know, eight to 10 seconds. How, I'm wondering how you teach college grads to be better at whiteboarding than I am. Literally it's rinse, ring, repeat. I mean, you just have, you, we, similar to everything else, we teach them the fundamentals, you know, write in all capitals, write in two to, you know, write in three inch letters, you know, try and stand aside, don't talk to the board, things like that. But then it's just giving them an exercise and letting them deliver it and giving them feedback and giving them another exercise and let them deliver that. And we do a lot of different things. So we have some visual stories that we tell around the Salesforce advantage and things like that. So, you know, we, again, can um, incorporate that throughout our entire, you know, six month journey that give them lots of opportunities to get better and better at it as, as you go. And some of them, some of them are very natural at it and knock it out of the park. Um, some people, you know, the lefties tend to struggle with it. Um, and it's, you know, I don't know how you, how you fix that, but, and then some people just, and I would put myself in this category, have really bad handwriting and you know it's uh the the more excited i get the the worse the worse my whiteboarding gets but you know i spent a long time in the telecom business so i've been drawing network diagrams and and stuff like that for years and uh, i am a believer in in that as a storytelling modality um i think it does several things a you have to know what you're talking about before you can get up and tell a story on a whiteboard. You can't, you can't really fake it. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, most of the time your audience is not expecting that. If you put a PowerPoint up, they have a preconceived notion of what PowerPoints look like. If you go to the whiteboard and say, hey, can I, can I walk you through this? And they don't know what you're going to write next. That's why you have that eight to 10 seconds because they're watching you write and they're trying to figure out where you're going. Mm -hmm. um, and I am just a believer that, you know, in the right circumstances. Now, am I going to get up in front of a, a classroom of 300 students and do that? No, probably not because it's visually just not going to work. I may do it, you know, using some, a tablet or something that broadcasts it up on screens, but that's a, a little different skill set. But, you know, most of the time we're not in those environments. We're in a room with, you know, five people. Well, if I'm in a conference room with five people, I'm going to, you know, if I can be really good on the whiteboard, I'm going to draw them in. And the other part that I like about it is you, you have something at the end. So you go snap a picture, say, here, let me email this to you. Uh, several years ago, uh, when I was still a sales manager, we had, uh, one of my reps and I were out at working with a CIO at an auto parts company. And we had gone through this whole whiteboarding exercise with him on, it was kind of a business strategy whiteboarding technique. And we got done and we took a picture of it. We sent him the picture and we both had some action items that we needed to fulfill. And so we said, all right, let's get back together two weeks out. And great, everything's good. Two weeks later, I walked back in the guy's office. That whiteboard is still on his whiteboard. And not only is it still there, but it had been annotated. No over the last two weeks. So, I mean, he'd been using it as a point of discussion with his own staff. I, I could not have been happier. I mean, that was, <laughs> that was like one of my greatest moments in 29 years of sales because he was bought in and now he was co-creating. And that's ultimately what we want. And that's what you can do with a whiteboard that you can't do with a PowerPoint deck is that whole co-creation. Mm-hmm. Uh, anytime I see Jocker, Jocko Vanderkuj, or Vander, I think it's Vanderkuj, um, I, I'll include a couple of links. Amazing, amazing on the whiteboard. Um, yeah. He's even got, he, I think he writes backwards on a piece of glass for some of his YouTube videos. The guy, like that level of talent, I, I can hardly write forwards. <laughs> I like super impressed that he's doing this. 
Um, maybe there's some mirror or some trick there. Yeah, but any, I don't any know. Any recommendations, uh, books, podcast courses for learn how to not suck at whiteboarding? <laughs> um, there is a book. I want to say it's called Back of the Napkin. And it's not so much about the skills of the whiteboard, but it's, it's the idea of using a, a drawn visual medium for storytelling. Um, and I don't remember the name of the author. I think his first name is Dan, but I may, could be making that up. Dan Rome. Is That's that the guy? it. Yeah. Perfect. So um, really like that. And that was the book that kind of got me headed down the road on, on creating what I call visual stories um, and worked with some of my team uh, in my sales academy back in interactive intelligence where we created kind of a whole series of visual stories around that and, and kind of the same things that you would build in a PowerPoint deck where you talk about, you know, you maybe use some Gartner stats or some Forrester stats or, but, you know, once you get comfortable with it, then it becomes, hey, you know, here's something we found, can I walk you through this? And, and again, it's, it's the way to tell the story to get them thinking in a different way. And, and like I said, if you do it right, potentially then start some co-creation. That's beautiful. I love how throughout this whole piece, it's, it's not the lazy way that I've done things in the past, which is here are the books that inspired me, go read these. And you've got to read them by this. It's you're cherry picking the best parts of the book. You're turning them into sort of a classroom environment and saying, okay, go practice. And yeah. you can, you, I'm, I'm assuming you're telling them about the books along the way. But yeah. It feels like the, the piece that's really getting them to put rubber to road is the, Hey, you've got this presentation. You have to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, the fact that it all builds upon itself. So, you know, if you're hiring early career professionals, you may not be able to do all of this. You know, we, we have them here trapped in a room for six months and we're teaching them this. Your organization may not be in a position to do that. You may be, you know, if you could get two weeks, that may be a miracle. Well, mm -hmm. You can still kind of take the same approach. You just say, all right, we're going to every, every Thursday afternoon, we're going to spend four hours and we're going to do skill set. And kind of going back to something I said earlier, it's all about structure. So if your structure is, hey, I've got, a, I've got four guys starting. You know, we've got this onboarding that we do over, over a week or over two weeks. But what's that structure beyond that? And let's pull them off the phones for, for three or four hours and go teach them something else and then let them add that to their repertoire. So at the end of the year, I mean, if you did that, you end up with, you know, 48, 50, you know, four hour learning modules. They've, they've gained a lot of skills if you build them right. You don't have to have them trapped in a room for 40 hours a week for, for six months to, to see the results out of it. That's totally fair. And I, I love the idea of sort of separating it out and doing sort of one afternoon a week. Because even then, if you, if you repeated sort of every quarter, that's still only, you know, 52 divided by four. Colin, your math is super strong right now. <laughs> 13 <laughs> courses that, uh, that you got to do and you can do them on repeat. And I remember having yeah. Chris Bryce, Bryson on the podcast and he had, he, I can't remember the episode number, but he had a, um, he had a really great ability for, you know, drilling in and understanding and like almost testing the, the his sort of cohort of kids that he was working with and then saying, okay, here's what the next sort of curriculum is going to look like. And so you've got basically your stock bits. So say out of that 13 week set or 13 yeah, week sessions, maybe like eight of those are fixed and then the rest are, um, are like custom to the, to the individual, you know, what yeah. their individual needs are. Um, so I just, I love how sort of flexible you can make it. It doesn't have to be this great six month behemoth. Obviously that's going to be an amazing experience and you've got the capstone projects and this and that, but that just because we can't take six months to train somebody doesn't mean, you know, we can't uh, take and implement some of the things that we're learning here. Yeah. And I would, I would say you, and you don't have to have a staff sales trainer to do this either. I mean, if you're a sales manager and I, I was for 25 years, I, you know, I was doing similar things as a sales manager, obviously in much smaller bite-sized chunks because we still had a nut to hit. But, you know, I am a believer you're either getting better or you're getting worse. There is no plateau in sales. And so I don't care how long you've been doing it, there's something you can learn. There's some new skill you can pick up 
or there's some skill you've already got that could use a little polishing. You know, there's a reason that baseball players take batting practice every day. Mm -hmm. It's not because they haven't hit enough baseballs in their life. It's because, you know, they, that's part of the gig. And, you know, to me, role playing, if you're in sales and your boss doesn't have you in honing those skills, you might want to think about where you're working. A really, a really great uh, comment to leave everybody with. And I love the, the batting cage analogy because you're, you're a hundred percent right. If you're not getting in that cage, you, your competitors are and yep. they're doing it more. And even if you're staying the same, you know, in relation to everybody else, you're falling behind. Exactly. I, I swear I, this, this feels like it was only a 15 minute conversation, but we've been going for quite a while. I could easily take hours upon hours and hours of your time. And I want to, I can't thank you enough, Steve. You're very welcome. Um, what's the best way if somebody is interested in one of these cohorts, if they want to get in touch with you, if they've got a question about something we talked about today, what's the best way for them to reach out? Yeah. The easiest way to reach me is through LinkedIn. It's Steve Bullington. And um, I'm happy to correspond with anybody. And if anyone has a, recent 2019 college grad that is uh, looking for a meaningful beginning to their career. Uh, we have a whole bunch of jobs posted at salesforce.com. Just search for success graduate. And uh, I think there are about three or four roles that will pop up and we'll be hiring those over the next uh, six to eight weeks. So uh, it's a, we, a program we're very proud of and we, uh, we think it uh, will, will be a long lasting value to the organization. Right on. And I, I put your, your LinkedIn uh, at, the, at the bottom of the show notes here in the links section. So if anybody's trying to track Steve down, you can find the link there. Perfect. Right on. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Steve. Thanks everybody for listening and we'll see you all next week.